here on Jane Unchained at 1 p.m. Pacific time. It's the Plant-Based Business Hour, and I'm Elizabeth Alfano. Thanks for being interested in seeing a safer future for ourselves. A safer future is dependent on a safer food supply, and a safer food supply we know is plant-based foods. So plant-based foods not only represents the big solution, but it also represents big money. So I do this platform because I want to give consumers and investors an opportunity to learn about all the new plant-based foods and businesses that are out there so that we can help this economy grow and just bring to people's attention just how vital plant-based foods are for our future and security, but also what good business opportunities they are, not just for money, but also the use of resources. In this COVID time, it concerns me that perhaps people aren't making the connection that meat is the source of meat-borne pandemics, like something that we're living through right now. But it's not the only meat-borne pandemic that we've experienced. Asian bird flu, African swine fever, mad cow disease, Ebola. The list does go on. The CDC says that approximately 75% of pandemics are meat born. So we really need to look at a secure future and that is plant-based foods. So I want to bring on today an expert live from Spain. Although he himself is Dutch, he's a very important investor, Michiel van Dersen. I am trying so hard to pronounce that right. Michiel, thanks for being with us. Thank you. You pronounce it perfectly like a Dutch person. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> I try. Me. <laughs> I try. And you are originally Dutch, of course, and you lived then in Belgium and now in Spain. But I have to get my travel chops on. Were you in Amsterdam? Is that where you lived? Amsterdam, yes. Yeah. So I was born in the south of Holland, then moved to the north, and then ended up in Amsterdam. Such a wonderful country. I've only been to Amsterdam and Bruges, but I loved them both and uh, have kind of a love affair with the country. So how lovely. Now, of course, you are in Spain. Um, love Spain, love the food, love the people. It'd be great if they could get rid of bullfighting. So I'll leave you to yes. work on that with the officials of Spain. I would be very grateful for that. Uh, but of course, getting rid of bullfighting is maybe something we're both interested in, but not where your attention lies. Your attention is focused on plant-based businesses. Let me give people a quick snippet about you. You're originally a tech investor and you created the largest internet platform for classifieds in Belgium. And then you went on to do an Amsterdam based internet agency and a tech incubator. And when you finally sold these things, you thought, okay, I'm going to focus on my health. And it's in being a triathlete and getting your health on that you started to recognize, okay, there's something here with plant-based businesses. And you decided to invest in same. So let me ask you, first of all, how does it feel to invest in other companies and not be running your own? It's great. I think. <laughs> sure. I, I did run my own company for a long time and it's, it's, it costs a lot of energy, but it's also a good to uh, have control over everything. So now as an investor, I'm more on the sidelines, which is of course totally different. And sometimes I want to jump in and, and do it myself or have too much uh, advice for the entrepreneur. But I also know uh, that you have to do it yourself as an, uh, as a founder, as an entrepreneur. So I try to only be there when, when needed. Yes. Well, that I would think would be very difficult to be hands off after being so focused on running something yourself. And then now you're sort of running in the backgrounds, which is a little tricky. Um, I'm wondering from your perspective, how many companies seek you out or do you just find them through actual pitch meetings? Uh, well, yeah, that, I was just thinking about that myself the other day. And uh, in fact, uh, lots of companies, uh, I get I get maybe tens or maybe more pitch decks per week that I have to, uh, that I'm looking at. I get a lot of uh, pitch days, which I, which I like from syndicates. Uh, Glasswell mm -hmm. Syndicate does a really nice job. I love them. Uh, in, in Europe, you have ProVeg, they do uh, pitch days. Um, but the... the some companies, the most successful I invested in, like the vegetarian butcher years ago, I saw their products in the supermarket. I thought, this is it. This is, this is the future. And I just, uh, I send them a tweet and say, do you need an investor or an entrepreneur, ex-entrepreneur turned investor to help you as your business? And it turned out that 
co-founder was doing the Twitter himself, the, their their account. So oh my gosh, it was immediately a, a click. We talked, we uh, we we connected, and uh, that's how I became their investor. This, and was, they, this was years ago. The, you that was one of the first companies you invested in, correct? Yes, in the plant based space. And which was later bought up by Unilever, I believe. True. Yeah. 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 Yes. One and a half year ago or so. Yeah. Before yes. the before the IPO of uh, Beyond Meat, even it was very special that day. Yes. Yes. It, it's you know. So you had success early on, which probably helped propel you forward into more companies because now you've invested way beyond the vegetarian butcher. Um, we both are are looking at a company called Better Nature. I'm very interested in them. Yes, I have great really high hopes is. for them. They're going to be on this show. Uh, but oh, you have got. Great a large portfolio of companies that you invest in and you're also connected to other organizations. So you mentioned Glasswell Syndicate and also Blue Horizon. I think you're just starting to yes. be a managing partner with them and Kale United. And so there's lots of um, organizations out there, venture capital groups out there that are investing in plant-based businesses. So you have your finger in lots of pies. So tell us. I try to, yeah. Well, it's smart to be so diversified, but you sit in a particular position. You can tell us what is coming down the pipeline. What should we be expecting to see? Well, first of all, I think um, I, what I try to do really is to have my hands everywhere and my eyes because I'm just a one person investor. So I need to have a, a really big network and it helps. And everybody's super friendly because this vegan space, everybody yes. is so passionate and nice and helping uh, about what is uh, what is now coming. I see a lot of <coughs> alternative protein, of course. Uh, after a Beyond Meat uh, IPO, we have Impossible and, <coughs> sorry. and and Big Meat is trying to uh, to also copy that. Everybody is trying to do burgers and balls and, mm. uh, and, uh, and that kind of stuff. I think that's um, it's kind of quite mature already that space. So I'm looking at uh, at other things as well, uh, like alternative proteins that are uh, uh, more healthy. Like you said, Better Nature. It's based on tempeh, which is super clean. It's nature I grown. It has B12 in it. Yeah, exactly. That's great. Um, I think um, um, we have we have. Processed meat. The next thing I think fish will be a big one because the fish, the growing of fish is of course not good for the for the oceans and for health and everything as well. I expect a lot there. I think baby food is a thing that should be uh, coming up as as uh, as a category. It's of course very dangerous because everybody has been taught to feed your baby like like they always did with with dairy or something. But if you look at it, it's probably super healthy. And I think baby food, pet food, that will be a disruptive industry as well. Um, I think also, um, I'm, I'm not lo only looking at uh, food as an investor. I also look at other things like software, like materials. Mm -hmm. I invest in a few uh, companies that do alternatives for leather. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that later. But what I want to say now is uh, wool. I, if somebody invents wool that is vegan, I think that would be the biggest uh, disruption coming. Nobody's really working on it that I know of, but I hope somebody will uh, invent wool. I, uh, so we have a lot to unpack there. I love what you're saying. I have wrote down all these notes because I want to follow up. I love the idea of a plant-based wool. And um, Joaquin Phoenix speaks out so much about wool. There's probably an investor right there just saying if any entrepreneur has their eye on uh, a plant-based wool, that would be wonderful to see. I agree with you about the burger space. I think it's a pretty mature space. We've pretty much got saturation in the burger space. And it, there's been a lot of competition, uh, if that's the correct word, from meat and dairy already there yeah. as well. So you've got Smithfield coming in with, I think it's pure farmland and um, 
Nestle has their sweet earth and, yeah. you know, so yeah. there's a lot going on in that space. And I'm glad for that. I think the more that they get in, the better. I would love to know if you agree about that. But I think the more, from my perspective, meat and dairy hops on with their distribution channels and their big pockets and their big advertising budgets. I think that's really a good thing, but we need more than burgers. And if you're going to, you know, here in the U S I don't know what it's like in Europe here in the U S there's been a lot of fear, um, uh, putting the, the fear of God, I'll say, in people about, oh my God, are we going to have enough food? Uh, because processing plants for meat, slaughterhouses, wet markets in the United yeah. States, which exist, are shutting down because of COVID. They haven't been following six feet of separation. And so a lot of employees are getting sick and they've been shutting down. And as I see, as my own personal uh, take here, that they've been protecting themselves by saying, don't punish us too hard for not running good ethical businesses uh, because we're your food source. Now, of course, there are many other food sources but, but besides burgers, but um, I think now is the time for plant-based to get in there and say, well, we've got your substitute right here. So I do want to see more than just burgers. I want to see steak and bacon and these things. Yes, yes. And luckily, a lot of companies are working on that already. And I see plant-based milk is already past that momentum, I believe. I think more than 10%, even 15% in the US of all milks are plant-based. So I think consumers are already thinking that's normal. And from there, it's a little step to, for example, butter, for example, ice cream, yogurt, all that kind of stuff. So yes, you're baby steps, but it will come. You're 100% right. In the US, I've heard figures between 13 and 19%, but the most common figure I hear is 14%. The plant-based milks have taken over of the category. Plant-based milks has a little bit of a head start because so many people are lactose intolerant, and so that naturally leads them to the alternatives. But I think people are starting to put in their head that meat is dangerous. We see it with COVID and these meat-borne pandemics, and then, of course, just health disease you know, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, all yeah, these kind of things. Yeah. Uh, so we're at the saturation point for burgers, but you're talking about fish. And I think, I think when they started this year, they said 2020 was going to be the year of plant-based chicken, but I actually think 2020 is going to be the year of plant-based fish. I sort of see it popping up everywhere. Yes, I hope so. Yeah, totally. I think chicken as well, because it will become like the burgers mainstream. In, in yes. Europe, you already have uh, chicken is, I think, one of the biggest uh, categories because of yes. the vegetarian butcher and some others. Um, mm. They have a chicken, uh, a really good chicken product. Um, but fish, yeah, totally, that will come. And I think maybe if, if, not, if not this year, it will be next year. But um, it will definitely come and people need it. And also yeah. imagine what, what well, you, you, we know that already. I heard it in previous uh, shows of you as well, but all the stuff you eat, it's not healthy. Fish is full of, of, of everything they use. Pollutants, mercury. Yeah, yes. exactly. Heavy metals, even Heavy probably metal. radioactivity. Yeah. If it's Japanese uh, codfish. It's really not health. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you say that. All these uh, long lists of unhealthy uh, issues with meat and dairy and fish, and people don't always yeah. realize it. Um, but it's so difficult. Uh, the burgers they hacked, they already tried to make it better than the original, and that's super important because if you need to get meat eaters and fish eaters change, you need to get, create a product that is the same or probably even better, better. than the original. And then... Uh, well, we are almost there, I think. People are working hard on it. Smart, smart people. Yes. Uh, so now in fish, do you think you're going to see plant-based fish or is it really going to be heavier on the cellular aquaculture? I think both. I think plant-based fish is, is, is coming. It's not so difficult as well. And then mm -hmm. also there are people, I, the market will be growing so hard. I think we, we will see a lot of everything. Maybe it will be a combination in the end. Mm. cell based and then for the price or for the substance or the texture they will put plant based in it i think in the end we are going to a to a hybrid form really a hybrid per product or you mean a hybrid in that both options are available on the shelves or you actually mean that a hybrid in the product itself i think in the product itself when once the price is going down and the production is moving up i think they can print with, with micro, well, with 3D printing, more or less, they can print the structure using cells and 
plant-based material to create a perfect product. I see that uh, happening. Would you this is not tomorrow or, or next year. This will be five years from now. Would you invest in 3D plant-based printing? I think that would be a good thing. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, you can create a structure at that point. I, uh, it's fascinating to me. It's fascinating to me. So, okay, you have all these things. You're talking about plant-based leather and fish yeah. and, um, you know, you're sort of past burgers, if you will, which I'm just thrilled to have a conversation where we can say we're past burgers. Like yes. we've got one major category under our belt. I, I'm we, the royal we. I have never invented a plant-based burger, but I'm just saying as a community, I'm so happy to hear that. And, you know, you're looking for plant-based wool, so it's very exciting. Okay, so there are so many options out there now. How do you decide which ones you're actually going to fund? Oh, that's uh, that's difficult. I really would like to fund them all. Mm. So to begin with, there's so many good uh, entrepreneurs and companies out there. I wish I had unlimited amounts of money, but I don't. So I have to make choices. And what I choose is, uh, is, is first of all, impact. I want to have as many <coughs> um, animals out of the production chain as possible. So every every dollar I have to invest will will have as many uh, as many animals uh, removed from production. And then still after that process, you still have a lot of amazing uh, companies. And then I look at the team, at the entrepreneur, at the people that that are gonna do it. I think it's very important that they have. Uh, I look at mostly at I call it the three F's. It's finance, focus and fun i call it it's they need to get their numbers that's the finance they need to dream their numbers they need to know everything about the company margins costs everything then day and night if i call them in the middle of the night they need to uh, be able to talk about these numbers that's so important <laughs> and then and then um uh, fun. I think passion is super important. That's why I prefer vegan uh, entrepreneurs over non-vegans because they have this extra drive. They have this. It's not only about making money or getting a product to market, but it's also this in, intrinsic drive of moving forward and focus. Um, you have to have, as, a, as an entrepreneur, you have to have a vision, a really uh, a, a bit longer than next month or next year or, or tomorrow. You really need to go where, need to know where you're going and work on that and have focus and not get distracted by the, the daily news or whatever is happening out there. You just need to follow your, yeah, your goal. So it's it's amazing because I think one might think it's the idea that attracts you most, but ultimately it really does come down to that team because it's the team that can yeah. can bring it to market or not. And not every company makes it to market. Not every team can execute. Uh, but I will say that vegans have, I'm going to quote Seth Tibbet here, who's the founder of Tofurky. Vegans do have their own superpower because when you um, – combine that vision and strategy with that passion, vegans have that extra motivation to get, as you say, impact investing as many animals out of the equation as possible. So there's that extra superpower that vegans have, and I can understand wanting to follow that passion for sure. Well, so, okay, unfortunately, you can't invest in everything, which uh, would be great if you could. But I, I'm wondering if you have any tips for small businesses when they come to you for money. Is there anything that you kind of coach them on or, or tips that you would even have as a business person and as an investor for starting a small business? Um, well, the tips are that what I just said, the, the finance and the focus and the passion and all that stuff. I, I, I really appreciate a good uh, pitch deck with realistic uh, things mm -hmm. in it, not your hockey stick curve and then in three years it will be a billion dollar company, but just realistic figures in it. Um, I think it's very important nowadays in this COVID time, but it was always to uh, build a bond with your potential investors to create mm -hmm. a long, la not just approach them when you need the money, but start early, just create a connection already, inform them about your brand. Because it's important, you can tell everybody how amazing you are, but mm -hmm. 
but if you show them it's 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 better more convincing yeah and mm -hmm. then i can believe in you and then also when you connect with as many and as uh, as many investors strategic investors as possible in the end when you need money you have them all already lined up for first and second you can get so much great advice along the way from these people i think that's a good uh, strategy to work with yeah, I think that's very smart. You want to be up close and personal with your investors and you want to do yeah. it early. That makes so much sense. But I love what you say about being realistic about your numbers. So I believe you already mentioned, if you haven't, I will mention it here, Lisa Feria and Glasswell Syndicate. They are wonderful. And one of the things that Lisa Feria has said on this show is that, uh, you know, you have to be realistic about your numbers for a bunch of reasons. First of all, you want people to take you seriously. So we know that they're sort of exuberance right now about plant-based and so some people are getting into the industry throwing money at it and so there's a tendency to say like oh i will value my company really high because there's money out there but then you have to remember it's not a seed round and a round one of financing and a round two it's a round three four five and so if you want to get more money down the line if you start out really big, it's really hard yeah. to continue that when you go for your Series F funding. So uh, being realistic, I think, goes a lot a long way and being credible as well. Very important to be realistic. Yeah, totally. Because I see now a lot of, in, in this COVID times, I see a lot of companies that started too high as well, and now they have to do down rounds. So uh, value their company lower than before, and that's not a good sign. Nobody likes that. Yes, so nobody likes. Realistic. Yeah, nobody likes to see that because confidence, just like with the public markets, confidence is such an important factor. I would think as an investor. Yes, it is. And also, um, another thing is, I think it's important to be creative as well. Now, if you you need a lot of runway as a company, you need to last longer with your money, so you need to bootstrap more. I think the COVID will change a lot. Nobody knows for sure. I started my company in a, in a crisis times. So it's very important, I think, to understand uh, how long you can last with your money. Don't spend it on unnecessary things. Keep, keep at least a year, year or so money in the bank so you can last longer. I love that you say this. I always say to entrepreneurs, I was an entrepreneur myself. Um, and I always say, you know, it's not necessarily the smartest or the best connected or the best looking. It's usually the person who's willing to work the hardest and who yeah. can make their money last the longest. Yeah. Uh, I found when I started my first company, I started it in a downturn and it was a wonderful time to start a company because I could make all my mistakes, which everybody will, yes. you know, your first couple of years, you'll make them, but it's not such a big deal because the market's not exactly ready for you anyway. But by the time the market was ready for me and when it was going gangbusters, I was ready too. So I, I always say like a downtime is a great time to start a company because you can get everything a little cheaper and you can make your mistakes without anybody really noticing. <laughs> Totally, I can connect to that so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I even had to. Well, I started two companies uh, closely uh, after each other. First, the uh, classified ads website, which was my main company, and then we needed so much money. Uh, we needed we needed money to uh, to survive on that because you didn't make money on the internet at that time yet. Google didn't have AdSense and all that stuff. So. I had to think creatively. There was no investor money around at the time. So I had to create the other money to the other company to make money in the market, to just build websites for corporate uh, companies to fund ourselves. So there was just actually a coincidence that I, uh, I created another internet agency. I love what you're saying. You have to be so creative as you're saying, I'll say sort of, crafty and scrappy all at once yes. because you know you you don't know where your income is going to come from and so you you your answer to that was to start another business oh my god so if you think that entrepreneurs already work day and night and their investors yes. are calling them in the middle of the night wanting to know their numbers like you you're you're a driving investor in addition it might mean starting another business just to have cash flow so um you you have to eat sleep and in the end live it. in the end that was even good because i had two mm. sources of income so when the one was going up the other one was when the one was going down the other one was going up and I had, I, that's why I now say to startups also is try to diversify your income. 
don't only focus on food service, but also direct to consumer or supermarket or something like that. Mm. That's also great advice. Uh, living through COVID times, we've seen how important that is. I had a vegan shoe company here. They produce all their shoes in Florence. It's very exciting to see Florence now consider vegan leather and that these long time leather makers are working in vegan leather for the first time. It's called yes. Mink Shoes. Yes, I'm, I've invested in that, in fact. So she was on this show, yeah. Rebecca Mink. Yeah. I love her. Um, she's kind enough to send me a pair of shoes that I'm going to show everybody oh, on social great. media. So yes, great. Uh, I love her. She was on and, you know, she was saying she was happy that she had thought ahead to go direct to consumer so that, you know, here now we are in COVID mm -hmm. times and she doesn't have all of her eggs and one bat, all of her jelly beans. What's a vegan, all of her carrots in one cradle. <laughs> I don't know what to say, but so she's, you know, she was diversified and it really helped her to get through COVID times, which was smart i love that brand it's yeah, great. Me too. beautiful me too and i like yeah. her so um and we live right next to each other which is so fun uh so you are in a very unique position because you are in europe but of course so much is happening in the u.s for investments and so much is happening in asia i wonder if you could kind of give us the global perspective of how the plant-based startup market compares between asia the u.s and europe Yes, of course. Well, they are very different, in fact. Uh, Europe, where I can start with, it's, of course, a lot of little countries with their own rules, regulations, languages even. So if mm. you make it big in one country, it doesn't say you make it big in your neighboring country. It's mm. just uh, it's difficult to, to get out of your country. But that also means that you are once you get a market there, which is pretty easy, uh, because you don't have that much competition, mm -hmm. you are you can stay in that market. It's a, it's a good market, albeit a bit smaller. In the mm -hmm. US, for example, it's super competitive. There's a lot of money going around, a lot of investors sitting there throwing money at everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. We don't have that in Europe. So we have to be. Um, and then in the us it's super competitive it's difficult to get into the supermarkets it's difficult to get to get attention of the consumers but once you win once you have that you're in once you win you're in it's just uh, you have a huge market opening up and all the rules and regulations are the same they're also a bit easier than in europe mm -hmm. so uh, it's not not as easy as to make it in the us but once you do you make it big and then china of course or asia I think it's China mostly. That's super interesting because they, for vegan, I was in China, I think four or five years ago for the first time. And I, I went out, I, I wanted to eat something and uh, I, I, in any restaurant everywhere was meat. I even went to the bakery and mm -hmm. I bought a piece of bread and I thought, okay, this is probably vegan. And then I, I took a bite and there was pieces of bacon in it. So they didn't have anything vegan. That was mm. so crazy. And then the government uh, in China, they see that it's not really sustainable what's happening now. Uh, they cannot feed their whole country. They import a lot of food from the rest of the world. And they said, OK, before 2024, we have to uh, reduce our meat consumption with 50 percent. And, that's, and then if the government in, uh, in China says something, everybody does it. So when I was back in China two years ago, I didn't know all this, but I stepped out of my hotel, I looked around, and there was a vegan restaurant. It was crazy. And I thought, oh, well, what a coincidence. And I looked the other way, and there was a vegetarian restaurant and, and another one. So it really, it's super fast growing. And the consumers, because they have all these weird illnesses now with, with their big... Uh, uh, flu and whatever they have the consumers also shy away and and of course because of the covid virus they understand that uh, it's not so good for your health so everybody is really uh, well positioned for the big change that is happening and i think china is now the new place to be the hottest place to uh, to go in because the market is friendly the consumers are waiting the government is cooperating 
Uh, so much to unpack there. I uh, Let's get into it. This is so fascinating to me. So I'm with you on Europe and the US. I, I think we're all there. Europe is going to be a smaller marketplace, a little easier to enter, although more regulated. The US, harder to enter, lots of competition, but not as much regulation. And when you're in, you're already into a big market, which is pretty great. Let's talk about Asia. So I know that Singapore has... Um, a very supportive government for entrepreneurs in general, and yeah. that some plant-based companies have been using Singapore as their base. But I think they're doing that primarily because they have their eye on the prize, which is the 1.4 billion people in China. Now, I had Sebastiano on this show. Don't we love him? Yeah, uh, and he was right. talking about a 50% reduction in meat, but I did not know that it was by 2024. Can you tell me when the Chinese government made that decision? I read it, um, I think two years ago, it was in the newspapers. Already. Okay. So it's already a long time uh, being. I see somebody now saying maybe they're going back to their veg veggie roots and that's true. In China, they, they never were as meat eater, eating as we were. So that's, uh, they already had a lot of vegetarian uh, products and vegan products and the yes. Buddhism religion they they also think you, you should not eat animals i think maybe they are they're more uh, focused on their own uh, traditions one would think that would make a lot of sense because when they switched over to western eating as they got wealthier th then came all the health problems so we're talking about the expensive health problems like heart disease and diabetes and obesity and all that kind of thing that you never used to see in asia or china specifically yeah. but in addition i think you said something very interesting to me you said that people are starting to be wary because of these strange illnesses in addition to covid at first i thought you were talking about covid but tell me what you're saying there I was saying the African swine flu you had oh, yes. in China or still yes. and all these, what you in the intro also referred to the, the yes. big diseases that all come from, uh, from a huge animal production facilities. That's right. Asian bird flu and, uh, Asian yeah. uh, swine fever, swine flu, swine flu. flu. Yeah, Sorry, know. excuse me. Uh, both I raging know, yeah. through China right now. They have not been able to get a handle on either of those as I understand it. And perhaps I have this wrong. Uh, neither of us are health professionals. I'll say that. So, you know, be sure to get you double check this information if you are interested folks but as i understand it now swine fever has not been transmitted yet from animal to people but they say that it's only a matter of time in animals pigs it's a hundred percent fatal this is what i understand and bird flu we know because we've lived through h1n1 times h5n8 i mean there's so many of them now we just had a breakout of 300,000 turkeys were decimated because in north carolina there's a bird flu breakout here and bird flu breaks out in the u.s all the time so um and that can transmit to people as we saw with sars etc so um in holland turkey, you had a, a mink farm uh, yeah. And that the minks they had uh, COVID from the from the humans. So it's the other way around. First humans get it from the animals, and then the animals get it back from humans. Mm. So they had to close these farms. And how do the animals fare? Are they are they like humans in that the majority of them get through the virus without a problem, or what does it do to them? They do don't they? release a lot of information about. Yes, of course of they don't. Of course no. they don't. <laughs> yes, they don't. Okay, but but the what our takeaway here we we digress a little bit, but the takeaway yeah. here. Is by 2024, China is looking at reducing its meat consumption by 50%. I think maybe that 2025, yeah, but in, a, yeah. in five years' time or so, yeah. Yes. And uh, as we're discussing, when the Chinese government decides, you know, if they say electric cars, then everyone has to get an electric car. If they say 50% yeah. less meat, then it's 50% less meat. Um, so I think it's very fascinating, you know, and then just a geopolitical layer on top of all this uh, with trade talks, et cetera. And if you have someone unpredictable and slightly crazy opposite you at the negotiation table for trade talks, it's hard to be a strong negotiator if that's crazy side has control over your food. So China, I would think, has a lot of interest in getting its food supply worked out and being more secure in that. 
Yeah, as, and as well as pollution, they have a lot of pollution as well. So mm -hmm. I guess they uh, they are solving everything by going plant based. Yes, well, and and we already know this, and this is why it's such yeah. an important business market. It does address the animal welfare, the environmental issues, the health issues, um, and so much more. Really, it does take take it all on. So uh, okay, let me ask you then um, more some some maybe esoteric questions. You did talk about it a little bit in the beginning, but what are your predictions? For for the future so we all think it's going plant-based but more specific than that where do you think we're going in the next five years uh well that's a really great question but also broad i can yes. answer that from a lot of point of views but let me i think first of all um the momentum is there it's like when I started uh, my internet business, everybody thought, oh, this Amazon, that's, uh, that's just a hype, you know? Newspapers will also be, uh, will always be uh, important and uh, Amazon will, uh, will fall over in a while and we don't need all that. And, uh, and now Amazon, Facebook, Google, companies that didn't even exist at the time are now the biggest companies in the, in the world almost. So I think this will also happen with, uh, with veganism with the plant-based industry. Also because of, you just said that all the, the, the meat, the meat uh, companies, they, uh, they think we, we are missing the boat. We need to also do this. So we start copying it. We start copying the Beyond Meat Burger. We mm -hmm. call it something else, but that's not really working. In the past, you also had the newspaper companies starting uh, online websites, but that never, Really worked. The, the Facebooks came up and the Googles and they win the pure players because they don't have the past to, uh, to also uh, uh, compete with their own uh, base. Um, I think uh, the tipping point is there because there's so much information out there. Uh, people know what's going on now. People are informed. Information is going everywhere. It's free. It's available. It's mm -hmm. unlike any other time and people know that it's wrong. And that's why also people are focused now on health, health more than ever, mm -hmm. because they see the relationship with food and, and their body and the world, even the plant, the global warming. Um, so I think, and personally, I think uh, it's exponential. Everybody after COVID knows what exponential means. It's doubling every day. And then you yes. have a lot in, in a month. So, if you tell two people or five people to go vegan and convince them, and they in turn do five people each, so then it's going so fast and it's going faster and faster. Mm -hmm. so I think uh, uh, it's going super fast. Yeah. I, I have a couple of questions there. Um, I am surprised to hear you say that you think big meat and dairy isn't really going to be able to um, be the majority stakeholder in this market. I kind of assumed that they would be, that they would switch over their, their production lines to over time include uh, less meat and more plant-based products and that they would kind of control the area because of their large distribution channels. But you're saying no. Yeah, no, I think they will in the end. I think in the beginning they will try to, 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 do the best of both worlds. Try to have right. their animal feed and pro animals and protect that market and step into the new market, which is plant-based. But I think if you do both, you cannot, you, you cannot do it good. So in the end, they will invest in pure players like Tyson, I, I believe it was, invested yes. in Beyond Meat. Yes. And, and, then, and then they will probably start buying up the vegan companies and make them a big part of their own uh, mission, like Unilever did. And then the vegan brands can change the big companies, the big meat players also from the inside out. And in <sighs> the end, they, that will happen. And I think in the, in the short term, they will stop, uh, they will try a lot of things, but not necessarily succeed. So this is fascinating and also from a small investor perspective, perhaps a little disappointing in that I think I'm expecting there won't be as many IPOs 
as we would like, and that maybe it's going to be these vegan companies that are bought up by meat and dairy and the IPO that Beyond Meat had, for example, will kind of skip the public and will go right to um, the big conglomerates buying up these companies. So is there going to be an opportunity for the small investor to get into IPOs or do you see very few IPOs in the future? In the near future, I don't expect a lot of IPOs to happen. That's what we always see after a big uh, crisis event. Mm -hmm. But after that, of course, there will. But I think there is a lot of opportunity now. Uh, I use it a lot myself. I really like it. It's crowdfunding. People uh -huh. can, can, can invest in, in companies in a really early stage as a crowdfunder and be part of that company. And for the company themselves, the startups, if they need money, and it's not readily available as well, they can get it from, the, from their consumers and they have ambassadors as well immediately. And and how would people find out about crowdfunding? Because um, I think when we think of crowdfunding, we think of things like Kickstarter. And so you're sending your friend a link to give $5 to this or that, but you're really talking about something else. How, how does someone get into crowdfunding for small vegan businesses? It is, it is like that. There are a lot of Kickstarter kind of sites. And um, mm -hmm. I think there should be... Uh, uh, probably there isn't yet. I get I get a lot of uh, uh, of them, of course, because I'm I'm in the middle of the market. But there should be an overview. Somebody should make that of all the active vegan crowdfunding around. But in the UK, for example, you have Cedar, which is a crowdfunding platform, and they have a lot of vegan uh, offers. Mm -hmm. Always vegan companies. Great. I yes. wrote that down. Cedar, everybody. S e e d e r. Cedar dot com. Um, so if you're looking to get in, in, in big and you missed, uh, beyond meat, so something to consider. Um, well, and I, guess I wish, I also wish, uh, <clears throat> all the small time investors have the same opportunities as the bigger investors like me, but of course that's not there yet. But I see also a lot of banks and, and funds and stuff moving slowly, but steadily in that direction. They are all now wondering what to do with this market, how they can get in, how they can create funds or vehicles that normal people can also uh, invest in. That's yes, I'm thing. looking to have a bank on this show because I think that's an important part of the equation that isn't really there yet. So uh, no. stay tuned, everybody. Uh, so let me ask you, what do you, because you've been in this for a while now, what do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now besides investing in plant-based businesses? Personally, I think... Uh, my health, uh, how important food is uh, for your own personal health. I didn't know that. I was super unhealthy when I uh, was always uh, working on my computer sites and everything. I didn't uh, really uh, eat super healthy. I thought a bag of chocolate with the same calorie count was the same as a healthy meal. So I was also a bit more, uh, uh, there was a bit more of me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I tried, and then, then I went vegan. I saw cowspiracy. I was already vegetarian, but I saw cowspiracy. I went vegan the day after. I yeah. felt more uh, full of energy. I felt more uh, active. I started to train for Ironman. And then I got an accident just mm -hmm. before the Ironman race. I, uh, a car hit me, a big SUV, and I was on my bike. So, uh, that was uh, painful. I was in the hospital for three weeks in a coma. It was really terrible. And the doctor said, um, you have to prepare for a really long uh, uh, re recovery and uh, you need to uh, get ready for the, to accept that you will never be the same uh, again. And then I thought, I will show them what a vegan can do. And I started to train harder than I ever did. Well, super slow in the beginning. And I started to really uh, be interested in what food does. And I learned so much. And food can be used as a medicine. Food is so important for the body and for health. And I think I, I, I love to have known that before 10 years ago. Thank you for that great story. I will be putting that out on Instagram very shortly. Uh, that's really wonderful to hear. And I'm so glad that you've made such a great recovery and that you showed them what vegans can do. You're an awesome vegan. Yeah, sure. yeah. thank you. <laughs> and uh, I recovered totally. So they were long after. And were they surprised? They didn't expect this kind of recovery. They didn't from expect you. it, no. Yeah. No. What did they say when you told them it was because of your diet? 
Doctors are a bit skeptical, of course. They uh, they don't have a lot of uh, education on on food, so uh, I think they just uh, thought it was them or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Okay, well they might be the last two. Doctors invest. should have more education and nutrition. I'm, Shouldn't I'm they? Sure. Yes, yeah. we always talk about that on this show. Just if you don't know it, doctors only get about four, in the U.S. only get about four mm. hours of nutrition education in medical school, and that medical school is four years plus four years of residency. Yet we go to these people for nutritional advice. So I always tell people on this show: you must advocate for yourselves. You must get your own information. Yeah, and don't, totally. Don't lean on your banker or your doctor or whomever. Really, for your own life, your own self, your own wallet, your own health, your own longevity. You really need to advocate for yourself. Uh, so just a couple of quickie wrap up questions here. This has already been such a great interview. Thank you so much. Um, you. you kind of already answered it the moment you knew you'd go vegan. And so many people do say movies like Cowspiracy, they're really so yes. important. Um, I'm wondering if you have, because you're such a dedicated and focused person already, not only in business, but also a triathlete that shows you what kind of personality you have. I wonder if you have any phrase that you tell yourself every day, or if you're having a bad day to get yourself back in the game, a phrase that really sums up your life philosophy. Yes. I don't have a thing that I say to myself every day, but I do have some kind of, uh, some phrases that I use uh, when I really uh, need it. And I think, um, one time to the best, it's change is good. Because hmm. people are sometimes afraid of change. I have it myself. Yeah, I just don't want to do something. And then I think it's good. And I also, uh, I studied psychology, neuropsychology uh, as a student. And it, it's all about the brain. And it turns out that if you change a lot of things, if you are open for change, I mean, if you like innovation, if you try different things, all the time it's super good for your brain and for your mental health mm. as well that's uh, that's one and the other one i um i may have not um uh created myself 100 percent. i think some other brands also use it but it's just do it sometimes mm -hmm. you just have to do stuff yes yeah can't overthink it just gotta hop no, right exactly. in there just do it yeah just do it. Over, get done. yeah I think that was originally Nike, but um, yeah, yeah, maybe, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Well, okay. You seem to be a very super healthy guy and you're still training all the time and you're biking, doing long bike rides. You, everyone can go to your Instagram and see that you're very healthy and getting outdoors, you know, post COVID and pre COVID. Uh, but I'm wondering, usually I say, does anybody have a favorite junk food? But for you, I'll say, do you maybe have a favorite snack or favorite junk food? Uh -huh. Yeah, well, because I love them. Well, junk food is always burgers somehow. I love them, but I don't eat them as much as I, uh, as is good. Well, uh, I always love, love sweets, as I said. I love to eat chocolate. I love to eat candy. Love that stuff. Yeah, bags and bags of it. But I don't do that now. <laughs> so I switched something in my mind and I, I changed the view of, of it. And now what I really am happy eating is a fruit platter. Just a, a bowl of mango strawberries banana mixed together and and it's sweet it's delicious nature gives us that and it's it's like candy to me it's mm -hmm. delicious yeah that's my favorite go-to snack good fruit really is like candy when it's really ripe oh, and yes. in season and fresh the, that's really just um nature's delicious food for sure the best um hope i'm getting this right michiel yeah. yeah, okay. I want thank to thank you. you for being with us on the Plant Based Business Hour. I hope that you'll come back. It's fascinating to talk to you. Thank you for giving us the perspective from Asia, Europe, and the US, and for giving us some tips for, for crowdfunding, maybe uh, if we want to get into it, but also what to look for an exec team, a strong exec team, as well as a, a good idea. Um, I do thank you for all that you do because you yourself live by example. And so you're such a wonderful example showing those doctors what vegans can do. I do. Thank you for that. And I hope that we can stay in touch. You're welcome back on this show anytime. I would love to. Thank you so much.
I, really I super, enjoyed it. I super appreciate it. Everybody, I am taking a tiny break because I have been reporting so much on plant-based business during COVID. I'm going to start the plant-based business hour every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday right here on Jane Unchained at 1 p.m. So join me. Tuesday will be my next show. I can't wait to be with you. Until then, thank you, Michiel. And, Thank um, you, Elizabeth. <laughs> and together we are taking back our health and the health of the planet. Bye, everybody. See you on Tuesday. Bye. Stay with me for just a second. Bye, everybody.